Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, once again for coming out for the next in our series of lectures on Vietnamese history from the beginning to sort of the 20, uh, 21st uh, century. What I want to concentrate on today is, is really the reaction of the Vietnamese, we can say in general, to the West. And the West and modernization and industrial civilization presented itself to the Vietnamese in the form of French colonialism. So Vietnam was different from Japan and different from Thailand in the sense that those two peoples were never conquered by a European country. The Chinese were sort of quasi-conquered, but other countries, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, Indonesia, the Philippines, were all ruled by, by Western powers. And Vietnam was ruled by the French from about, well, technically all of Vietnam, 1884 down to 1954. And as I'd mentioned in the last lecture, the, the French philosophy of rule uh, and practice of rule had two parts to it, one of which was practical, the other of which was sort of moral. The practical part of French rule was an understanding that they could make an alliance with certain social elements inside Vietnam, and those social elements would cooperate with French rule. One of those social elements were actually the Mandarin families, the very wealthy landlord families who'd come out of the Confucian tradition of the Nguyen dynasty. And as the Nguyen dynasty collapsed, and as faith in Neo-Confucianism evaporated, these families needed two things to maintain their social status. One was power, and the other was some kind of a, of a moral ideology. And the French could provide the power, because they had wealth, they had, they had guns, they had modern armies, they could build railroads, they had telegraphs, they were building the modern cities of Hanoi and, and Saigon in the south. And they also had a, an ideology, which was French education, French civilization, French civilization, French um, uh, teachings in math and science and literature, the heritage of Moliere, the heritage of, of uh, Voltaire, Diderot, uh, uh, Rousseau, uh, all the French writings, the French scholars, they brought all that to Vietnam. Now, the second sort of element that aligned with the French were Vietnamese Catholics, because they saw Catholicism as a universal faith, and the French were, were leaders in Catholicism. Um, and uh, the French Catholics also had an affinity with Vietnamese Catholics. The third element, I would say, are just individual Vietnamese who were looking for uh, self-advancement and power and riches. And they became, particularly in the uh, Mekong Delta area, down here in Cochin, China, these were just landlord families who were particularly interested in social power, prestige, and, and uh, uh, the prominence in, in society because they could become very wealthy, own a lot of land, have businesses. So the second part of the French vision for Vietnam, which started in about 1902, uh, after the col colonialism was in effect. There was a necessity on the French part to sort of justify colonialism. Why are you there? Why are all these French people thousands of miles away from France to rule, to govern, to direct uh, this other people in Vietnam? Part of the explanation for French colonialism was pure as with other colonialisms, I think, was just pure national pride and advantage. We're here to make money. We're here that France can become a great power, the equal to the British and the Germans and things like that. And end of story. It's an expression of our power uh, as, as a great people. The second part which the French developed is this notion of the mission civilatrice, uh, which was a special French mission in their colonial enterprise both in Vietnam and in all French colonies, but particularly in Africa. Uh, they had a mission, they had a calling. It was uh, to do something good for other people. What was good for other people was to make them French. The mission was to civilize all these other people, Africans and Vietnamese, Lao and Cambodians, into the culture, the language, the literature, the knowledge, the, the superiority, frankly, of being French. So that if you asked a French, well, why are you here? Or if the Vietnamese would say, wait a minute, why are you people ruling us? It was a very simple answer. We're here to educate you. We're here to make you better. And so the French started a whole series of schools. Uh, but the schools were not, if you will, mass popular education. 
The schools were sort of elitist institutions teaching in French, teaching uh, people in the French tradition, and the apex of this educational system was the Sorbonne in Paris. So they created a sense of inferiority among many Vietnamese that we're not Western, we're not French, we're not well educated, we're, we're, we're behind, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're backward, and a sense of competition in other Vietnamese to study the French and become just as good as the French are and go to Paris. And the great place to go, the great sign of success for Vietnamese who wanted to become French was Paris. To live in Paris, to be educated in Paris, to speak French as a Frenchman would, to read French novels and to have that facility, that, that uh, uh, joie de vivre that the French have, a uh, sense of élan and a sense of intellectual sophistication. So this is the French sort of presence in Vietnam, starting about 1902. And these schools get built in the first, second, third decades of the uh, 20th century. Now, what's the Vietnamese reaction to this? Um, I want to argue that um, there are basically, there were three reactions. And I want to talk about these reactions uh, in this in the succeeding lecture. The, the first reaction of Vietnamese was to accept the French terms that they were superior and therefore to westernize yourself, to become Western. Now immediately we can see that this creates some sort of issue for your identity. Because if you become Western, well then what are you as a Vietnamese? How can someone who is not ethnically French, coming from generations of French people, really become French? If you're Vietnamese, all your ancestry and everything like that is Vietnamese. If you're from the Cote d'Ivoire, you're, you're African in some sense. And no matter how much you study French, no matter how much you write French poetry or something like that, you're not really French French. Um, so the, the decision to sort of westernize le leads to all kinds of tough issues about identity. Who am I? What's my value? What should I do? Things like that. Now, um, the, the decision to westernize led to there were two, two ways. One, you cooperated with the French and you accepted to some extent the legitimacy of French values and French rules. Or you westernized yourself, but you opposed the French using Western values, using French values to oppose the French. And in Vietnam, that track took two forms, which we'll talk about one more than the other. One form was called constitutionalism, which was to study French, the tradition of law, the tradition of human rights, the tradition of democracy, and say to the French, under your own rules, under your own rules of human rights, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, 1789 of the French Revolution, you have no right to rule Vietnam. We can have our own constitution. We have our own human rights. Uh, it, is, it is the will of the majority of the Vietnamese people. That's the way you Westerners think. You have to bring that kind of rule to Vietnam. So they set up fairly early on, 1921, a constitutionalist party. They agitated for elections. They agitated for democracy in a Western sense. The second alternative of using Western values to oppose the French was communism. And I'm going to talk a lot about that when we get to Ho Chi Minh and the er emergence of the Communist Party. Now, the and question about what about Vietnamese Catholics? Some very interesting issues. Are Vietnamese Catholics, are they more Vietnamese than Catholic? Or are they more Catholic and French than they are Vietnamese? Or is there some sort of a melange in Vietnamese Catholicism of Vietnamese tradition and practices with Christian traditions? Um, not easy questions, I think, to answer. Now, the second response to the West, to the French, to the French civilization was total and complete rejection of the French on Vietnamese grounds. But since the French had all the power, what do you do? if you reject the West and, and French civilization? Well, one sort of alternative to this was old-fashioned Mandarin Confucian families. You withdrew into the family and you maintained kind of Confucian values within the family and you basically, you didn't interact with the French at all. You just tried to wall yourself off. You tried to create a private space. Um, you had at, at uh, 
as, as much sort of a, an area where you tried to create with your, your friends, your family, your relatives, your own world. Now, one of the stories in our family about this was my father-in-law, uh, who was quite, quite elderly uh, when he married my mother-in-law. So he lived, he was born, I think, 1890 or something like that. Anyway, the story is, at, I think 1911, I think the French changed the language in which you could take the exams to become a government official. They changed the language from Chinese characters to the modern Vietnamese quốc ngữ, the, uh, the, the, the Latin, uh, the Romanized script in which you write Vietnamese. I mean, it's just use letters which are all familiar to us in the West. So up to that point, if you, you studied Chinese characters and you went up to become an official, you took the examination in Chinese characters. So my father-in-law, apparently, as his family had done for generations, he'd studied all these Chinese characters, the Confucian classics and all this stuff. So he goes up, I think it was to Hanoi, to take the entry-level exam. And when he gets up there, there's a notice that this year the exam has to be written in Kukno, which he's never studied. So apparently the story is he sees this without saying a word. He just turns around and walks back to the village. And my sense is that was sort of like, okay, that's it. I mean, I'm not playing their game anymore. And so he spent his life basically uh, as a landlord, as a very wealthy and very prominent person in Hanoi, making money but creating a private sphere for himself and his family. Had nothing to do with the French. He wouldn't oppose them. He wouldn't fight them. But just it was sort of a, a private kind of contempt for all this, this westernization. The two significant alternatives come out down here in the south. And there are two religions. There's the Wahao and the Kaodai religion. The Kaodai from the 1920s, the Wahao from the late 1930s. And we'll talk about them. And their response was to go back into the ancient religious traditions and create something which was authentically uh, Asian or authentically Vietnamese. And they would use that for religious, social, and political purposes. Because these religions got involved in opposing the French and in seeking to drive the French out of Vietnam. The third alternative, which was, which is, I think, which is the most important alternative and sets up the, the, the trauma of Vietnam in the 20th century down to this very moment was the rediscovery of nationalism or the rediscovery of Vietnamese ness or the rediscovery of the young top. All the things we've been talking about in the prior lectures, beliefs in spirits, the call of rivers and mountains, the fact that the people in the South had a right to their own day, their own ruler who could communicate to heaven, uh, that the Vietnamese at a people, as a people had, had honor and pride and tradition. This has to be rediscovered uh, because the Nguyen dynasty had kind of suppressed this. It has to be rediscovered and then defended against not only the French, but also against the communists. So the story there is the story of the, of the rise of the nationalist movements, the VNQDD party we'll talk about today, the Dai Viet tradition we'll talk about today, and their interface with the communists and the French. Uh, and we'll take up our discussion sort of to the beginning of World War II, because what happens at the end of World War II, thanks to the Japanese, everything in Vietnam gets thrown up in the air and it's chaotic. And out of the chaos, uh, comes the, the, well, basically the, the, the three factions. The communist faction over here, the people who will cooperate with the French over here, and the nationalists uh, in the middle. And the competition between those three factions determines the history of Vietnam from 1945 uh, unto the present. So that's the, the overview of the French arrival and the response. Now what I would like to do is start with the key man we talked a little bit about last time, Fan Boy Zhao. And I want to read sort of some passages from his um, autobiography just uh, uh, here and there. Um, now, Fan Boy Zhao, uh, thank you. Maybe we should move this over a little bit so we can get on the, the video. Fan Boy Zhao was born into a Mandarin family loyal to the Nguyen dynasty in central Vietnam, in this part of Vietnam here. And as you may remember, after the French imposed a protectorate 
1884, there was a young king uh, with some, some older mandarins who fled into the mountains, back up into here to, to resist the French, to fight the French. And their slogan was Gung Vung, rally to the king, support the king. Problem was, nobody rallied. A few people did. But basically, the Vietnamese people were not going to support the Nguyen dynasty against the French. So the Mandarins gave up. I think to a large extent, they, they, uh, they really hadn't understood what had happened. Uh, Heaven Chai had, had turned against them. Uh, the French had some sort of power that they didn't have. Uh, they felt deserted. What to do? But Fen Poi Zhao uh, did not give up. And one of the things that uh, um, he did was to uh, begin the move away from the Nguyen dynasty formula of using Neo-Confucianism as the moral cause for the Vietnamese people. But, he, but they took small steps at a time. The first step they took was they got as their leader a descendant of the founder of the Nguyen dynasty, the man uh, uh, Yalong, King Yalong, or Nguyen An, who started the Nguyen dynasty. He had had a, his first son, we talked about before, was Prince Khan, and who died, and leaving a grandson. When Yalong picked a successor, he didn't pick his grandson, he picked another son by a minor wife. Descended from the grandson were several people, one of whom in the 1880s was a prince called Kuang Dei. So Fan Boy Zhao and other mandarins approached Kuang Dei to say, will you be the leader of a group to try to organize Vietnamese against the French? And Kuang Dei said, yes. And the idea was that they still needed, in order to rally the people, they still needed some figure, some leadership figure who had prestige. Again, that Vietnamese term is we didn't who had prestige, because that's how you get people to come together. Now, please remember, in all this time we're talking about, Vietnamese political dynamics are always basically bottom up, and they're democratic. Because you can't, Vietnamese are individualistic, very individualistic. They don't like to be bossed around. They don't like to be organized in tight organizational structures, the way Japanese do or Chinese do. So you have to get them to volunteer to step forward, which means they have to trust somebody. They have to believe that that leader has got some special powers or characteristics or intelligence or something like that, or is in touch with, with heavenly powers. So you need somebody like that. So Fan Poi Zhao um, picks Kung Dei, who's, who's with the Nguyen dynasty, but he's a sort of a small part of the Nguyen dynasty. So like it's a half step away from using the Nguyen dynasty to fight the French. And they spend a number of years um, 1902, 1903, visiting various underground leaders who are not publicly involved in politics and don't, then there's no over, overt um, opposition to the French at this time. Um, then uh, in the third month of the Year of the Dragon, 1904, I returned from the south to Hue. From time to time, I thought of ways to add feet to our dragon, our movement. This was an important event in my life and warrants some discussion. At the time, King Dom Khan ascended the throne. France and Vietnam modified the conditions of their treaty, more and more advantage to the French. In spite of my misgivings, we were still a people who were determined to sacrifice our lives to save the country. Thus, I decided to look for a way to motivate the Mandarins. Got to, get to, got to get to the emotion of all these people individually. So he wrote a book uh, called The Lu Cao Huyet Le Tang Tu, The Bitter Tears of the Rukuyu Islands, using uh, uh, allergy to the Rukuyu Islands of the Japanese. Uh, in this book, I describe clearly the, dis of the disintegration of the capital, the loss of the country, and the shame of the lords who had become servants. And, um, but then he understood. Nope, still, nobody moved. I finally understood that I could not rely on the elders at all. The older mandarins, the older families, they were, they were working with this new French administration. In their gut, they only knew how to seek wealth and honors for themselves and their families. When they saw that something was about to happen, happen they would merely sit and watch to see whether it was a success or a failure, waiting to see where heaven is going. 
If you remember the famous poem of Wing Yu, Wing Yu says that the scales of heaven are in your own heart. These are people who say, no, no, let's see who wins. If you win, I follow you. If you lose, I'm sorry, I'm going to ignore you. Because my family and my power is the most important. My argument was that the rise of this focus on the family structure and power had come out in the 1600s and 1700s when the Vietnamese were fighting, when the old order had broken down, and these clans, the Trin, the Mac, the Nguyen, the Lê, were just fighting for the, for the power and dignity of, of the clans, not, not really for the nation. Um, afterwards, these elders would choose their allegiances according to which direction the winds of fortune had blown. Now this passage uh, drives Vietnamese politics from then until now. Many, many Vietnamese wait to see who the winner is going to be. If the Americans are going to come into Vietnam and win, we're with the Americans. If the Chinese are going to come into Vietnam and win, we're with the Chinese. If, uh, if, if Ho Chi Minh is going to become the prime minister, we're with Ho Chi Minh. If, if somebody else is going to move up, we're with him. And oh, by the way, we're only with Ho Chi Minh or somebody as long as it's clear he's going to win. If he's going to lose, we just, we just back away. So here in 1904, Phan Boi Chao is sensing the consequence of this sort of individualism of Vietnamese waiting for heaven to, uh, to somehow solve the problem. Uh, now, the next thing that happens, which is absolutely seminal, and Americans and Westerners, I think, have no idea about this, though we played a role in it, was the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. The significance of that was that in 1905, the Japanese Navy sunk the Russian Navy. Though I, and I forget what the Russians and the, the Japanese were starting to expand into Manchuria and the north. And the Russians uh, were worried about this. And they, it's, they were some pretext of war. And, the, and they declared war against the Japanese. And the Russians had a fleet in Vladivostok in the Pacific. Their main fleet, however, was in the Black Sea. So they sent their Black Sea fleet all the way around, and it spent the winter in Cameron Bay, here where it took on coal from Vietnam, and then it sailed up here, uh, and in the Straits of Tsushima, Tsushima, between Japan and Korea, there was a great naval battle. And the Japanese sunk, I think, every Russian ship. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are two things to focus on here. First of all, 40 years before, 1865, the Japanese were a feudal power, right? They had no battleships, they had no cannon, they, they had no gunpowder, they had nothing. They were a bunch of guys, the leadership were samurai, dressed in kimonos with a long sword and a short sword, running around Japan as they'd done for hundreds of years. That's 1865. Within 40 years, right, the Japanese people have built a world-class navy. Steel ships with huge cannons, they have trained officers, they have trained gunners, they, have, uh, they, they can sight, they can aim, they, they, they know how to sail ships. And the second point is, an Asian people, to be blunt, a yellow-skinned people, because that's sort of the vocabulary at this time, sank every ship of a white-skinned people. Not only that, Russia was a great empire, and the Japanese sunk every ship. This was like, especially for Vietnamese, like, oh my god. If the Japanese can do it, we can do it. So there's a whole movement starting among, Japanese, among Vietnamese intellectuals, led by Phan Boi Jiao and Kung Day, to look to Japan. So Phan Boi Jiao and Kung Day go to Japan. And they try to make an alliance. They try to do two things. They try to make an alliance with the Japanese, and they want to study the Japanese. How did you do it? Now, of course, one of the problems is Japanese are Japanese and Vietnamese are Vietnamese. And you just can't take some Japanese cultural political dynamic, bring it into Vietnam. But there was a vision that Asian people do not have to be subordinate to white people. Look at the example of the Japanese. And there was a big movement called the Dom Yu, the Go East movement. And all the young men who had some sense of patriotism, turning against the French, turning against the Nguyen dynasty, went to Japan or were inspired by, by Japan. Uh, and uh, Fan Boy Zhao writes, um, the great victory of Japan in the Russo-Japanese War had a tremendous impact upon us, for it was like a new and strange world opening up. Alas, in the middle of the 19th century, even though the universe was shaken by American winds and European rains, our country was still in a period of dreaming in a deep sleep. 
our people were still blind and resigned to their lot. Um, it's only because in former times we shut our doors and stayed at home, going round and around in circles of literary knowledge, examination, and Chinese studies. So the Nguyen Dynasty ideology, going back to the Trin and the others. Um, to say frankly that our people were deaf and blind is no exaggeration. So as a result of the Japanese victory, Fenboy Zhao and a whole generation start saying, we Vietnamese got to wake up. Neo-Confucianism, this Chinese thought, all this stuff, it, it's, it's the past. It keeps us uh, uh, blind and deaf and dumb. We have to move to something new. But the question is what and where. Um, one of the, the interesting things, uh, because he's a, he's a very important person, and he becomes um, quite well known, and we'll be talking about him a lot, is a man who later takes the name of Ho Chi Minh. Now, Ho Chi Minh is a young man at this time. His father is a Mandarin. The family comes from Nguyen in central Vietnam. The family comes right out of these Mandarin families who were part of the Nguyen Dynasty support structure. His, his, his name, Ho Chi Minh, his name was Nguyen Tuk Tan. His father was Nguyen Sin Hui, who was a, a junior level Mandarin. And because he was a junior level Mandarin, uh, the young Nguyen Tuk Tan was sent to study at the National School in Hue with the sons of all the great Mandarin families and a school for Mandarin families that was supported by the French government. Because these were the young men of these families who were going to be brought up in, in French civilization as well. Now, what I think is absolutely fundamental to understanding, understanding the man who becomes Ho Chi Minh and Vietnamese communism is that he doesn't go to Japan. He's not involved with the Dom Yu movement or all this thinking about, about finding some Asian basis for going back against the French. Uh, he goes to France. And um, in the mid-1980s, a Vietnamese scholar, Mr. Nguyen Thé An, found in the archives of the French colonial ministry these two letters written by Nguyen Tuc Tan in his own hand. These are Xerox copies of two letters. Um, in, on the 15th of September in 1911, is after the Russo-Japanese War, all, you know, Fan Boy Zhao, Kung Day are in Japan. Young people are trying to study in Japan and have figured how do we energize our Vietnamese people in a new way. And Ho Chi Minh, or Nguyen Tuc Tan, who signs it down here, um, who says, I was born in Vinh in 1892, uh, the son of Monsieur Nguyen Sin Hui, uh, an under doctorate in letters, uh, and I'm a student of French, Quoc Ngu, and uh, Chinese characters. One letter is to the Minister of Colonies. The other letter is to the President of the Republic. And uh, he says, I have the honor to the, uh, uh, this is the same text to each man. I have the honor to, uh, to solicit your, your, your high kindness and the favor uh, of uh, being admitted to the school, uh, to the colonial school as an intern. I'm asking you to admit me to the school that trains French colonial administrators. He wants to become a French colonial administrator. Now, the French, they reject him. But think of what might have happened. If the French had taken this young guy, trained him to be a French administrator, he would have spent his entire life killing communists. <laughs> right? And yet he comes out as one of the leaders because they rejected him. Anger. Rejecting people is not always a good thing to do. And they get angry. And he says here, I have just arrived from Marseille. It says it's written in Marseille. Marseille, the 15th of I've just arrived here on the, the uh, Chasseur Reuni. Um, that's the line. And I have uh, been working for them, and I've just arrived on L'Admiral Latouche Treval. It's known that he worked for that company, and he was on that boat from Saigon to France. He's left Saigon on this French boat. He was a busboy. And as soon as he arrives, he writes to the Minister of Colonies, the President of the Republic, saying, I want to serve France. And uh, just trying to think there's a, yeah. Um, I want to, I, I des je désirais enlever utile à la France 
vis-à-vis -vis mes compatriotes, I want to make myself useful to France vis-à-vis -vis my compatriots. So the, the significance of this, I suggest, uh, is profound because I think we learn most about a young person, particularly a, a man, let's say, at this kind of young age. This is when men, basically, you make your choices. You're going to be a football player, what are you going to do? Uh, what are you going to do in life? And, and when we get in our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, or 50s, we've learned different skills, we can position ourselves, we've had ups and downs in life. But here, when, every, when our future is ahead of us and our dreams are strong, this gives us an insight into the driving character of anybody. This guy's driving character was to serve France. Uh, so now let me talk um, a little bit now about, about Ho Chi Minh in the next little period here. Remember, we've got Fan Boy Zhao. Um, he's over in China. And we've got some, uh, there are various things going on in Vietnam. There's some small revolts. There's a school, uh, a, a con one of the constitutionalists, a man by the name of Fan, uh, Fan Zhao Trinh, he sets up a school in Hanoi uh, which combines both sort of French education with technical education, but has an undercurrent of anti-French feeling, the Dom Kien Nghe And uh, there's also great protests in 1908, sort of mass protests against the French. Uh, and they're broken up by the French. The school is closed. There's a, a, a strange a Taoist Buddhist sect in 1908 and 1913 in Saigon, these 150 guys attack Saigon and they're going to try to conquer Saigon because they think at some magical special hour heaven is going to come down and all the French will disappear. And so they have to be ready to take over the South when, when the gates of heaven open, opens and, and Vietnam's destiny comes back. Well, obviously you can't take Saigon with 150 guys coming up from the Delta with pitchforks. Uh, so there's these kind of, of all these little sort of irritations against the French, but nothing major. Uh, Ho Chi Minh sails around. He visits, apparently, Harlem for a couple of months. He works. He comes back to, to, uh, to Paris uh, towards the end of World War I, and several things happen. Uh, one is he's living with Fan Chu Trinh, who is this very famous uh, Vietnamese, who was, who was a classmate of his father. And Fan Chu Trinh is one of the ones who's taken this constitutionalist approach. You adopt French values and you use them to argue against the French. Give us our human rights, give us democracy, give us constitutionalism, uh, keep your, walk your own talk. And Fan Chau Trinh and several other Vietnamese uh, in uh, Paris at this time wrote, a, like I think it was a weekly column in a newspaper. And they put a name on the column of Nguyen Ai Quoc, was the name of the column. And that means Nguyen the patriot, Nguyen who loves the country. But the different men would write different things. I'd write the essay this week. You'd write the essay next week. It was a pen name. And Ho Chi Minh apparently was, was living and working. He was also a photographer's assistant in Paris. And he would run articles back and forth. And uh, it's possible he might have actually written one or two of these things himself. But he's a young man. Then, as I can't remember exactly the year, it's in one of the biographies. But uh, at the end of sort of World War I, Ho Chi Minh, or Nguyen Tuc Tan, I should use his real name, um, Nguyen Tuc Tan reads Lenin, an essay by Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who has just uh, established the, the Bolshevik regime in Russia after 1917. So now communism is not only an, uh, an ideology, it's got a base. They got a big country now. They got Russia. Um, and one of Lenin's essays was, on, was his most famous essay, which was an advance on Marx, was his essay about imperialism. He wrote a very famous essay explaining how capitalism and the struggle for production by the capitalist created colonialism. <coughs> Basically, the thesis is that there are all these tensions between the proletariat and the capitalists, and the proletariats get weaker and weaker. Their buying power goes down and down. So the markets um, are too small in capitalist countries like France, Germany, and Italy. So in order to get sort of more energy, more raw materials for your, your capitalism, you got to go conquer other countries. And that gives rise to imperialism. And the struggle among the different capitalist orders, French, uh, Germans, and British, to drive their imperialism is what explains the competition among the states and World War I. 
World War I was, de was described by Lenin, explained by Lenin as a result of, of imperialism as these, these imperialist capitalist elites were fighting each other for the right to rule parts of the world. And Wing Tuck Tan writes this someplace, when he read this, he said it was like, it was like a religious awakening. He suddenly understood everything, and he saw himself standing on a balcony with masses of Vietnamese people on the streets below him, and he was lecturing them and leading them, and they were applauding him as their great leader. The interesting thing to me here is in this man's psychology, two things are coming together. His own role as this great leader of Vietnam and Lenin's thesis, which has nothing to do with Vietnamese nationalism. He's inspired by something that's completely Western, which fits with his earlier decision to want to serve France. Ho has followed the path, or we keep calling him Ho, but Wing Tuk Tan, this young guy, has followed the path of going with the West. Now, this has another point I mentioned at the last lesson, or last lecture, and I um, want to emphasize here. The whole notion of class struggle and class warfare around poverty is not Vietnamese. It's not very Asian at all. It's Western. It's brought to Vietnam by the French. Communism has this notion of class struggle. And communism is basically German plus, plus some British stuff. Um, and the second thing is um, the Vietnamese notion is individualism plus the ethnic group. Vietnamese have never really taught, you know, thought much about class rivalries and distinctions. But as I said last time, the French, when they start analyzing Vietnam, they talk about the ruling elite of the Mandarin class and the poor people. Thinking about property, thinking about wealth as the moral core of a human being is very Western. Most of the Asian cultures, most spiritually sophisticated cultures, I would argue, okay, you've got, you've got uh, Confucianism, you've got Buddhism, you've got Taoism. I would put Islam in this category as well. If you read Quran, um, Hinduism is this way. It is something spiritual that is at the core of the person, which then plays out in your politics or your economics or your wealth or something like that. But these religions always want to come back to the sort of the spiritual driver. Now, there's something in the Western tradition going back to the Greeks. Class divisions, according to property, were very central to Greek city-states. Aristotle writes about this. The politics of the Roman Republic are between the wealthy senatorial family and the plebs, the plebeians, the ordinary people, fighting each other over who's got money, who's got more wealth, uh, is a very Western thing. And it shows up in Vietnam via the French, does not come out of the Vietnamese villages or their own traditions. And the whole Communist Party, therefore, which fights in Vietnam, uh, and they, they only dropped the class struggle in the late 1980s, when it's pretty clear that Marxist-Leninism is just stupid and wrong. Uh, until that time, the whole thrust of the Communist Party at core is class warfare and class struggle. And we'll, we'll talk about their relationship with nationalism a little later. So we go back to Paris by 1920. Young Wing Tuck Tan reads Lenin. He gets inspired. He goes to the famous meeting in 1920 of the French Socialist Party, where there's a split between the socialists and the communists. Before that, they're all socialists together. And the communists set up the Third International, uh, which is run out of Moscow by Lenin and others. And Ho aligns with, or Wing Tuck Tan, who becomes Ho Chi Minh, aligns with those French who set up the Communist Party in France. This Vietnamese guy, Nguyen Tuc Tan, is one of the founders of the French Communist Party. Okay? Then in the early 1920s, I think it's 23, he, is, he goes to Moscow. Either he's recruited or he goes there. I'm not in, there's lots of scholarship on this, and there's lots of mystery about Nguyen Tuc Tan. Um, but he goes to Moscow. Now, to me, very interestingly, I have not seen this written in the histories. Now, of course, all the histories you get of Wing Tuk Tan written by Hanoi and the Communists present him now as this great Vietnamese leader and figurehead, and everything he did was, was filled with wonder and, and genius and insight and power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you don't really get the truth, a lot of the truth about uh, Wing Tuk Tan. But Wa and I were in, uh, my wife Wa and I were in uh, France the other year. We were having lunch with some older Vietnamese um, 
intellectuals, including three or four former communists, very high-ranking guys uh, in the communist movement. One was Bui Tin. Another guy was Wu Tuhiang, whose father, Wu Tuhiang's father, was Ho Chi Minh's uh, private secretary for a number of years. So Wu Tuhiang comes right out of the inner circle. And there was a third guy whose name I forget now, but we'd all had good food and some wine and we're chit-chatting afterwards. And these guys are, and we're sort of talking about various things, come to uh, Wing Tuk Tan. And these guys say, you know, the other thing, Steve, is he wasn't very smart. And I said, oh, really? He says, yeah. You know, the, uh, in Moscow in those days, there were two schools. There was the school for Marxist-Leninism, the training cadre for Marxist-Leninist cadres. And then there was the other school, which was something for like the oppressed peoples of the world, which was for the sort of lower, the people whom the, the, the Russian communists didn't trust and didn't think could be good cadres. They sent Wing Tuk Tan to the lower order school. He was never sent to the big school of Marxist-Leninist cadres, which I submit is an interesting indication that the core commun the Russian communists themselves, as they're, as they're allocating and setting up this international movement called the Comintern, they did not see this young Vietnamese guy as, as such a great, fantastic leader. Uh, so he trains there for a couple of years. Uh, he is then sent uh, to, to Hong Kong with the Comintern to work with, with a Russian guy, Borodin, who's in, who's in Hong Kong. Oh, he's in there in Shanghai. That's right, they're in Shanghai at this point. Because at this point in China, uh, the, the movement of Sun Yat-sen, the Chinese nationalists, have sort of an alliance with the Russians uh, against some, some warlord figures. And so Ho Chi Minh, or Nguyen Tuk Tan, who's now lose, using the name, I think, Li Tui, um, is in Shanghai organizing communist cells. As we know, communists organize person by person in small cell groups, three men here, 10 men here, four women over there. Uh, they don't really organize mass movements. So he's doing this, but we've arrived at the 1920s. Now, um, I want to shift to back to Vietnam itself in the 1920s, because another group starts to emerge in the 1920s. And this is a religion. And it, it comes out in Saigon and, and these provinces here. And it's the Cao Dai uh, religion. And the, the Cao Dai uh, uh, means sort of the, the, high, uh, the high stand, or the high uh, position. The, the top figure of the Cao Dai, uh, it has two names. Um, one is the, um, he's supposed to be the, uh, well, the Cao Dai, the, the Cao Dai is supposed to be the, um, um, the highest power, the highest god uh, in the universe, uh, which is in Chinese, it's the Ngap Wang, Ngap Wang, Tung Dei. Coming, uh, Tung is, is great, Dei is, is, is a god figure, heavenly figure, Ngap Wang is the Jade Emperor. Now, flowing into the Cao Dai tradition are uh, uh, Taoist beliefs, Chinese Taoist beliefs in particular, because the Jade Emperor is a figure of, of, uh, in the Taoist pantheon. And part of the Taoist beliefs uh, in China, not the old philosophical Taoists, uh, but the practical religion, is a belief in powerful spirits. Different men, different women, they live in different parts of the heavens, and you can call on them to help you and protect you. And like the, the, the myth in the uh, New Year's, the Lunar New Year's for the Vietnamese, Tet, is that there's, um, there's a spirit figure who lives in everybody's house, Om Tao. And, and it's kind of like Santa Claus, you know, naughty or nice. If you're, if you're nice, you get presents. If you're naughty, you get coal, right? Well, Om Tao is keeping a record during the year of who's naughty or who's nice. And at the end of the year, you know, when the old year is ending, the new year, all these Om Tao, they all go up to heaven, and they report to the Jade Emperor. Uh, Kalin did this, Wa did that, Steve did this. So the Jade Emperor is this big, powerful guy sitting up there in the, um, um, in, in the, um, in the heavens. Um, now, the, the other uh, term that the Cao Dai use um, is the Duk uh, Ji Ton, or loosely translated here, 
um, as, uh, as God, the God, God, Duk Chiton, who is also the Napuang Tung Day. So now this, I suggest, is going back to the core to very, very traditional Vietnamese and Asian, ancient Asian beliefs in some powerful spirit figure in the universe. Nothing to do with the French or Western rationality or science or anything like that. Now, the, um, the predecessor of, of the, the Cao Dai are various spirit medium cults. There are, down here in particular, uh, various cults in the early part of the 20th century which like to communicate with the spirits. And a number of them have the name Min for, for light or intelligence. This is also related to this belief of the, the Minchu, the Minchua, that at some point a, an enlightened lord will come from heaven or heaven will find and bring up an enlightened lord who will be our leader and get rid of the bad guys and get rid of social injustice and everything will be good. And it is believed by Vietnamese more than almost, uh, mo most. Uh, it's a Southeast Asian belief more than a, a Chinese belief, but it has some echoes with Shinto in Japan that human beings can talk to the spirits. We can communicate to the spirits. We can learn from them, they can protect us, they can give us warnings, they can give us uh, guidance as to what to do. And the way we talk to spirits is through various uh, tr trances or medium cults. Or there's also a belief, uh, the Hmong have this too, by the way, the Hmong shaman in our community here now, of shaman uh, mediums who have some inner special gift. That they can go in their minds, can go into the spirit realm, find a spirit, talk to it, and um, bring it back. I mentioned in, um, in a previous lecture in the uh, communist offensive of, of um, 1972, there was a province chief in Binh Dinh province who had a, a, went into a trance with a medium and spoke to the great nationalist leader Trung Hung Dao, who gave him a sword, gave the province chief a sword. So after that, everywhere the province chief went to organize the local villages and the local troops or build a bridge or something like that, he had a soldier standing next to him, apparently with a purple pillow, and sitting on this purple pillow was a wooden model of, of this sword. So all the Vietnamese, I'm sure, men and women, you know, old and young, especially the village people, uh, would see that sword and they say, whoa, this guy's, he's probably going to win. Notice it gets back to that thing that Fanboy Boi who's going to win, who's going to lose? If the spirit of Trung Hung Dao has come down and given him a battle plan to defeat the communists, he's probably going to win. We're on his side. The next thing I want to point out is that in, this, in the Khao Dai religion, this use of spirits, this is what the people believe in. This is not an elite movement. This is not coming down from powerful figures. This is not coming down from landlords or Confucian-educated people, and it's not coming down from French-educated people. It's, the, it's what the ordinary villagers, it's mass, it's popular, it's peasant, it's Vietnamese. And in the 1920s, there are various, this, this figure, Khao Dai, uh, by, by name and by personage, begins to show up in seances, a number of seances of middle level, of middle, middle class people. They're, they're, they're sort of moderately wealthy, they're lower level French officials, they come from larger families in smaller villages. They're sort of a middle ranking. They're not the elite, but they're not, they're not peasants. They're sort of middle ranking. And a number of them started by Ngo Ven uh, sort of catalyzed by Ngo Ven Chu, realize that there's this great spirit out there that wants to appear. And, and this is the third time in, in the history of the universe that, that this spirit is appearing. So the name of the religion is really the third appearance of God. Um, and what the spirit does is through these seances, you have, you have some sort of an instrument um, which you, you go into a trance and you meditate and somebody holds the instrument and it moves around and it writes various things. And that's the spirit. The spirit of Khao Dai or these other spirits at different levels are coming down and it writes and it leaves the, and then you interpret this and it tells you what to do. And the spirits created a whole religious structure with guidance, with prayers, uh, with, with other figures as well. And uh, at the top is God. And then the next to them are, are the, th at the next level are three, three beings. Buddha, the Sakyamuni Buddha, 
Lao Tzu, the fo founder of sort of philosophical Taoism, and Confucius. Um, but these people are not prayed to. The next level down, there is the, the great Tang Dynasty poet uh, uh, Li Ba, who's a, a wonderful poet in Chinese. There's also the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, a female figure, Kuan Am Botak. Then at the, then, uh, at the next level, there is the famous uh, Kuan Tan, um, Kuan, uh, Kuan Zhong. He is one of the famous um, warlords in the romance of the, th famous generals in the romance of the Three Kingdoms in China, about to where he takes an oath to help restore the Han Dynasty. And he's become a really famous guy. In fact, a lot of the altars in many Chinese stores, including some of the Chinese stores here in the Twin Cities, are, are to uh, uh, Kuan Tan, who's a military general, but somehow morphs into a great protective figure over the centuries. Um, then, uh, most interestingly, in the Kaodai High Temple in Tainin, which is up here, the, the main altar is to Kaodai. The second altar is to Fakba. Fakba Diutri Kim Mao, or the Holy Mother. At the center of the Kaodai faith is a maternal mother figure. May I suggest that this is again the reappearance <laughs> of the importance of the mother of the woman in Vietnamese culture going back centuries, back to when the Vietnam, back to the years when the Vietnamese were pre under, before the Chinese came in, when they were in a more of a matrifocal uh, tradition. And this echoes the power of the mother and the women in Vietnamese families to the present time. Um, and then they have another one. They have the Lei Sung Tan Mao. They have the Holy Mother of the Mountains. And then they have a whole bunch of others. Uh, they include uh, Zhang Jin, who was the man I, who I read some of his poetry, and he had these predictions in the, 1600, in the 1500s. Um, and the Kaodai religion also has, it has a very elaborate structure. It also has, um, we had at the time, in addition to the religious structure, it had a political structure. It had an executive, it had a legislature, it had sort of a court. And I never talked to any of the elders. I didn't know enough about it. But if you think about it, they organized like a government uh, almost in exile. They had a government structure ready to step in and take over Vietnam when the French disappeared. They also made an alliance with Fan Boi Chao and Kung De, who are in exile uh, in China in the 1920s. So we have a religion. Uh, which is going to some very deep uh, sort of mystical traditions of the Vietnamese, which has a maternal influence in it, which is also aware of a political structure and has a relationship with Fan Boi Chao and Kung Dei. And when you get to Cao Dai, you have completely moved beyond Neo-Confucian thinking, Chinese thinking. You've moved beyond the Nguyen Dynasty. You have reestablished a direct relationship between Vietnamese and the ultimate power of the cosmos just the way the ancient Vietnamese under the Lee and the Trung were arguing. We as Vietnamese have a right to talk to the greatest power in the universe. We can have a day. The Cao Dai have replicated down to the point of actual communication. They're communicating with this day through the spirit cults and the mediums. And so that's the way I think they sort of deal with the French and French culture. They just wall it off. They just ignore it. Um, I once had an experience. Uh, of going to the Holy See with my father in uh, 69, 70. Dad was visiting uh, South Vietnam, and we went up there uh, for a couple of reasons, but also because in the Vietnamese way, if you can sort of track this, Wa's oldest brother married a girl who was the niece of the leader of the Cao Dai religion. So like, we're kind of connected by marriage in there. His name was Ho Tung Kwa. And uh, in the family, they called him Bak Shao, uncle number six. But anyway, so he, there was this uh, lunch they arranged for my dad. So we went up there. And I was sitting at a long table. And my dad and the, and the senior people were here. And I was down here. And across from me were all these older men uh, in their 70s and 80s, the leaders of the Cao Dai. So they would have been born about 1900. So they would have been probably founders of this religion. Uh, and they're sitting across from me. And I just had this. And they were very reserved. 
not a lot of talking, um, and very reserved and withdrawn. And I suddenly sort of had a sense in listening to them and getting, this is old Vietnam. I am sitting in the Vietnam that existed before the French showed up. I mean, it's 1970, but these people, these men, they are the way, that they're, they've preserved something. They don't, they don't interact with the way all the younger people do or Western educated Vietnamese. There's something different here. And, and it's, it's, it's a sense of honor and tradition and, and older behaviors. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was special. Uh, now, one part of the, uh, and I don't know, and I haven't studied it enough, whether all these things were, came down from the spirit or whether individuals wrote them. But they have a section of their um, statutes called the Te Lut, which are 24 provisions about how to live in life. If you're a good cow die person, how are you supposed to live? Uh, and it's, um, there, there, it looks as individual um, self-discipline and compassion. Um, you have to respect your father and the mother. You have to love yourself. You have to uh, stay in touch with each other. You have to help each other. Uh, you, you have to have a heart of, of openness and honesty in the way you deal with other people. Um, and this is supposed to be both in, in, in the way you follow the religion and in your way of life, Dung Dai. And if you come into the religion, uh, you are supposed to forget all the things in you which are, which are filled with anger and hatred of one another. Uh, and you have to, after that, you have to tran, you have to avoid all the things of jealousy and rivalry and competition and uh, saying bad things about each other. Uh, you have to accept and, and be harmonious, hua uh, tuong, with each other. So again, here is, is a Vietnamese religion which is getting us in life and working on our internal morality, our internal virtue, our internal duk, just like the famous poem of Wing Yu said. Remember that the, the scales of heaven justice, heaven's justice are in our own hearts, not in our talents, not in, not in our positions. So we have the cow die in their own way underneath this umbrella uh, from uh, uh, the, the great God above, recreating, under French rule, a very Vietnamese sense of how to live and, and how to be. Now, um, in the late 1920s, we also have in, in China in uh, 1925, we have a betrayal. We have the old man, Fan Boi Zhao, who's in exile in China, with his network of supporters and followers in Vietnam. And the French don't like him. There's an arrest warrant out for him. Because I understand he's the leader. He's inspiring all these Vietnamese to, to uh, think about themselves as Vietnamese. So there's a price on his head, almost. Uh, so this young man, Nguyen Tuc Tan, who's now in Shanghai working for the Comintern, sets up a meeting with the old man, Fan Boi Zhao. And Fan Boi Zhao goes to his meeting this is in, in, in uh, now it's in Hong Kong. The meeting's in Hong Kong, in the part of Hong Kong which is controlled by the French. I'm sorry, Shanghai, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's in Shanghai, where the, Shanghai is a city which the Westerners created. It was not a Chinese city. The Westerners created it, and part was controlled by the British, and part by the French, and I think the Germans had a part. So Fan Boi Zhao goes into the French part of Shanghai, where he is betrayed by Ho Chi Minh to the French. So the French arrest him take him down to Saigon and put him on trial and he's sentenced to death. There's a protest movement, he's not executed, he's kept under house arrest until he dies in 1943 or something like that. But, hmm? That's 41. 41 maybe. Um, and um, thank you. Uh, but Ho Chi Minh, it is alleged by a number of sources, denied by the communists, but alleged by a number of sources, receives 100,000 piastres from the French which was a lot of money in 1925, which he then uses to take over Fan Boi Zhao's association, Tan a, a, a youth association. And he takes over Fan Boi Zhao's association and tries to bring it in to the international communist structure. That's 1925. In 1927, in Vietnam, another group is formed, and we'll, talk, we'll start the next lecture about this group and move on into the 1930s. 
1927, a new group is formed called the Vietnam Quoc Young Dang, the VNQDD for short, formed by a young man, Nguyen Thai Hau, uh, who was a student. Uh, he was a technical student, and it was modeled on Sun Yat-sen's party in China. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about the ideas of Sun Yat-sen, how they came into Vietnam, how the VNQDD was started, and how it led the first revolt, major revolt against the French in 1930 in Yen Bai. So thank you very much. Now, what is happening in the 1920s is uh, certain new kinds of organizations are being formed. Uh, the Kaudai is one, the Wahao is another, the Communists are another, uh, the VNQDD is another, the Dai Viet, which we'll see in various Dai Vieks, and, and new words are being used. And prior to the 1920s, Fenboy Zhao had several organizations, and there are others. There's a new word called the Hoi, uh, which means, it means group, or group or association. Now, in traditional Viet Vietnam, there, there were no groups, there were no associations. There were families, there were individuals, uh, there was the imperial structure. If, if you're going to organize people together, uh, you have to have some sort of structure. Well, what is it? What is it called? What is it like? So one word is a hoi. You set up a hoi. Now, a hoi has to have some organization. It's got to have a leader, it's got to have a, a deputy leader, it's maybe a treasurer, it's got to have some different branches and sections, different committees. The second thing that comes along now is something called a dang. Dang is party. Dang is also a, a, a Chinese word. Prior to this time, there, there, are, no, there are no dang in, in, in Vietnamese history. So the organization of dang is something new. The Communist Party is a dang starting in the 1920s. The VNQDD is going to be a dang, Vietnam Quoc Young Dang. The Dai Viet is going to be the Dai Viet Quoc Young Dang. Other parties are going to be formed. What is the internal dynamic of a dang? I want to suggest 
that it is like creating a new clan. It's creating a new kind of family. And the intensity of relationships inside a dang are kind of like family relationships or clan relationships. It's like all of us lay, we're all relatives of one another, we kind of stick together. All of us communists, are we're, we have mutual relationships like family relationships. We have older members, we have younger members, we have some people who are strong, some people weak, but we respect and we have this feeling, dintang anema, we have this spirit of, of older brother, younger brother, older sister, younger sister in this. And we, we, are, we, we support ourselves, we take care of ourselves, we listen to each other. Um, and it's, it, to me, I want to argue that something is emerging here in the 20s and 30s, new forms of organization to help the Vietnamese find a way uh, to collectively get together and accomplish things against the French. Now, the VNQDD, superficially, the Vietnam Quoc Yang Dang, first of all, it means um, Vietnam, the name of the nation. So notice we have a movement here back towards traditional nationalism. The name Viet has reemerged as part of a political movement. Remember the Nguyen dynasty, uh, uh, Min Mang changed the name to Dai Nam, the Great South. Uh, Phan Boi Chao, uh, the communist, and none of these groups, it's there the word Vietnam or Vietnamese. Here we have the name of the, the people. This ethnic nationalist concept has come back. Quoc is the formal Chinese word for nation or state. Young is people, Dang is party. This was taken from the party uh, set up in China by, by Sun Yat-sen, which then came down to Chiang Kai-shek, which then when the communists won in China, it goes over to Taiwan. And that was the Kuk Young Dang, or the Nation People's Party in China. And this party had its principles or ideology to replace Neo-Confucianism. And that ideology is the San Min Chu Yi, the, the three people's uh, uh, righteous principles. And the three people's righteous principles are um, the, uh, the nation, uh, the people, and the people's livelihood. And the nation is fairly is simple to understand. The people, I think, is uh, uh, fairly simple to understand. It's sort of modern, uh, modern nationalism. Uh, and it, it explains the uh, people's uh, sovereignty, the principle of democracy. Um, and the third one uh, on people's livelihood is a kind of version of uh, socialism. It's called Min Sheng Chu Yi, which is, is the people's, people's livelihood, people's living. And Sun Yat-sen writes in here in the 1920s about how it combines something of socialism. It's, it's government regulation of capitalism. It's bringing poor people into wealth. And so this is the book he wrote in the 1920s, which the Vietnamese take over and, and bring into Vietnam. A weakness in this, from my point of view, is that these are universal rationalistic principles which have no special emotional connection to Vietnam or the Vietnamese people. It's another kind of borrowing from the Chinese. It's not Neo-Confucianism, but it's doing that. And I think part of the dynamic uh, in 1927 for these young Vietnamese is that the, v, the, the QDD in China was rising up. They had overthrown the, the Qing dynasty. They were reasserting a Chinese nationalism uh, for the Chinese people and against the West. So if you're Vietnamese and you're breaking with the Nguyen dynasty, you, you don't want to go with the French, where do you go for a model? The Chinese have a political organization, the Dang. They have some, some principles you can organize which sound pretty good, the people, democracy, the land, and then this sort of people's livelihood. Uh, the, the next development uh, with the um, VNQDD, and this is, a, this is a history of the early years of the party written by one of the founders, uh, Wang Van Dao. Uh, and um, I, don't, I don't even know if these things are, this book is available uh, very much anymore, but this is written by members as to how they organized and, and what they did. Um, the significant thing about the VNQDD in 1930, uh, they are plotting a revolt against the French. One of the problems of the Vietnamese to revolt is they don't have any guns. Now, the French have guns and the French have an army. What to do? 
one of the uh, uh, plans that Nguyen Thai Hop and his young friends came up with is to recruit Vietnamese soldiers who are in the French army and security forces. Because most of the French army uh, was basically Vietnamese soldiers led by French officers. There were actually very few large military units which were completely French. So if you could get the, officer, the, if you could get the soldiers to revolt against their officers, and, and they could then bring the forts and the guns and everything, and, and you could conquer, drive out the French. So the VNQDD was infiltrating Vietnamese, military, Vietnamese French military units. And they had planned a revolt in the fort of Yên Bai, which is sort of up here, uh, on a particular date. Now, the French had been developing uh, intelligence services and penetration agents and uh, a good police work to deal with all this Vietnamese opposition. So they had penetration agents inside some of the VNQDD. They had double agents. They had uh, some of the soldiers uh, who were either or else just um, talking too much and, and spilling the, the information. So the French learned that there was going to be uh, this revolt, and they began to move their forces and to warn people. The leadership of the VNQDD uh, with Nguyen Thai Hop uh, learned that the French knew uh, that there was going to be this uprising on a particular date in, in 1930. And so they met like the night before, uh, or two days before, I think, to decide what to do. Call it off or go forward. If you go forward, you know you're going to lose. Because the, the, the enemy already knows uh, you're going to be there, and, and they'll, they're bringing their troops up, and there's no way you can win. The decision was made to go forward knowing that they're going to lose and they'll all probably be killed. Um, and so they, and one of the famous sayings for many, many years among Vietnamese nationalists was the argument after the conclusion is made, Nguyen Thai Hop, who's quite young, I think he's in his 20s, late 20s, I think, uh, in Vietnamese, he says, Nail come tan come, te it nyuk tan nyung. If we do not succeed, we will at least become men. And, the, and the, the phrase for men is nyung, and it, and it carries many levels of, of emotional connotation. One is it's the old phrase which goes back to Confucianism, ancient Confucianism, and Wing Chai for the moral person, the moral upright person. That's nyung. You have this character. Secondly, it goes to the, the sense of superiority and disdain of the white French against the Vietnamese. And so what Wing Chai says is at least, you know, we may not win but at least we'll be men. At least we will be standing up. We will die for something that's important and we can be proud of ourselves. And so they go off and it fails and Wing Tai Hop and others, the 12 others are arrested and, and guillotined by the French. And they are known as the 13 martyrs of Yên Bai. One of the other stories which is in here uh, is that um, Wing Tai Hop uh, had, had uh, married a girlfriend. The families had not approved. So they went to the temple of Trung Hung Dao and they married themselves uh, in front of the, the spirit of Trung Hung Dao. And by the, when, but when Wing Tai Hop was executed or was after Ying Wai, she is several months pregnant with, with their child. So the French find her and kill her and rip open her belly and kill the child too. And then they also go after the village, Ko Am village, where Wing Tai Hop comes from, and they try to just destroy the village. Now, a very, very important thing to understand what's going to start happening now from the West, vis-a-vis -vis the Vietnamese, is complete misunderstanding of Vietnam. And this misunderstanding, which starts here, is going to blossom into the American anti-war movement and bring about the American failure in Vietnam. The American anti-war movement and the American failure rests on a misunderstanding about the Vietnamese. And we first see this in the French reaction and coverage of the Yên Bai uprising in 1930. Because the French intelligence reports and the newspaper reports have to say, why, are the Viet why is there a revolt? If we French are bringing our civilization, all the beauties of French civilization, all the advantages of French civilization, why don't the Vietnamese appreciate us? Why do they want to rise up and shoot us? It doesn't make any sense. We're here to help the Vietnamese. We care about the Vietnamese. 
We have our mission, civilisatrice. We give them education. We take them to the Sorbonne. We brought railroads to Vietnam. Why, why are they so uh, um, ungrateful? Is this revolt in Yen Bai Vietnamese nationalism? No. This is a revolt by the communists. So the French either A, don't understand, or my suspicion is they sort of understand, but for political propaganda reasons, they can't afford to publicize this. They say, no, it's the communists. Political opposition in Vietnam is led by the communists. And, and it's all about property, right? It's the poor peasants revolting against wealthy families. Now, in 1930, what's the status of the Communist Party in Vietnam? Actually, in 1930, about the same time, Ho Chi Minh, or, or Nguyen Thuc Thanh, who's not yet Ho Chi Minh, uh, he calls together a meeting in Hong Kong of three different groups who are sort of in the common turn network. And in convening this meeting, uh, he has help from some French agents of the communists, some French communists. So they call together this meeting in, in, uh, in Hong Kong and they establish the Communist Party of Vietnam, which later on becomes the Indo-Chinese Communist Party as they bring in cadres from Laos and Cambodia. And in this meeting, I think there's something like 231 delegates. This is not a lot of people. And they represent small networks in Vietnam. But in 1930, the Communist Party is not much to speak of. And yet the French, when confronted with the uprising led by the VNQDD, they don't want to recognize Vietnamese nationalism. They want to recognize something that they can really understand, which is Western, which is communism. They don't really understand VNQDD. They don't really understand Cao Dai, Wa Hao, Vietnamese-ness. Also, Vietnamese-ness is a threat to them. Because Vietnamese-ness says that we don't need you French. You know, if we want to study uh, your civilization, that's fine. That's, that's up to us. We'll, we'll do it in our own way. But so the, the uh, Communist Party is founded in 1930 in Hong Kong. An interesting fact to me is that, that the man who becomes Ho Chi Minh is not picked to be the Secretary General of the party. In communist organizations, the Secretary General is the most important person because the Secretary General controls the staff, makes decisions, and makes appointments. And, it's, it's, and if you know, you have, the, you have committees, and it's the, it's the secretary of each committee who runs the committee at that level. The man who was picked is a man by the name of Trung Fu. Now, he's later, a year, within a year and a half, he's dead in a French prison. But he was picked as the first secretary general of the Communist Party, not the guy who shows up as Ho Chi Minh. And Trung Fu had, had been in Moscow in the Stalin school. He was trusted more by the Russian communists than uh, Wing Tuk Tan was. Later on in 1930, I think the argument is, though the communists say this is not true, that the communists, in order to gain prestige, vis-a-vis -vis the VNQDD, who now have great prestige, they actually took on the French. They've got 13 martyrs. Um, they've stood up, they've broken with the Nguyen dynasty. They're somehow moving back to a sense that we Vietnamese ought to control our own destiny. The communists, in order to challenge that, start a revolt, uh, Soviets. They have village revolts in Nghe An along here, and they call these village revolts Soviets. Uh, Soviet Nghe Tin. Uh, now, the Soviet concept is completely Russian, has nothing to do with Vietnam. Vietnamese don't know anything I mean, about the Soviet form of organization. It's a label put on local village revolts against the French, which have, which have been going on. The French repress uh, these uh, revolts very brutally, and, and after about six to eight months, it takes a long time for the French to do it. The villagers are tough and they're well organized. But after this, many of the leaders of the Communist Party are arrested and put in jail. And Ho Chi Minh, uh, never, he's not even in Vietnam, he stays in Hong Kong, and his whereabouts uh, from about 1931 to about 1941 are very vague. People, we really don't know where he was. He was in Thailand here and there, he may have been in Singapore, it's unclear. He, he leads a sort of a vagabond life uh, for about 10 years. It's also possible that he may have been back in, in Russia, but the thought is that this is, and now the 30s are when Stalin is starting his purges. 
and Stalin is liquidating all the communists who, who, whom he does not trust and like, the right communists and the left communists. And uh, by my mentor, Professor uh, Wee, uh, has the suspicion or had the feeling that Nguyen Thuc Thanh was never a hardcore Stalinist. This is probably true. This has been said by some people. Ho Chi Minh was, was a, really a nationalist and not really a communist. There's probably some reason to believe that he was not a hardcore Stalinist because his first introduction to communism was through Lenin's work on imperialism. Secondly, he was never taken to the, to the uh, main Marxist-Leninist school. Uh, he, would, he worked for the Comintern, which was uh, Bakunin. And uh, uh, Bakunin was, was purged by Stalin. And all of Bakunin's people were purged. So Professor Wee was, was surmising that the man who becomes Ho Chi Minh was probably pretty lucky not, not to have been uh, purged or sent to Siberia in the 1930s. But the communists fade out of the picture during the, 19, um, the 1930s. And, um, but I think before we go on, I want to think about some other aspects. Um, what, I, what I mentioned um, about Ho Chi Minh being formed primarily in a world of French thought is true for other key communist leaders. Another one, a very famous to the West, uh, is General Jap, or Vong Wing Jap, who becomes the military commander for the communists, uh, really against the French, and then he has a more minor role against the Americans. And he is known as the great victor in the Battle of Ding Ben Phu in 1954 against the French. And he is one of the, uh, um, the founders. But what is his background? Who is Vong Wing Jap? And how did he, as a young man, adopt to this? What was his response to the French in French civilization? Go to the West, become very traditional, get involved with, with, with rediscovering, re energizing Vietnamese nationalism. Well, Jap was born in 1912. So he's a sort of a generation younger than uh, Nguyen Thuc Tan. But he gets to go to the same school. In 1924, he enters the Lycée National, Quoc Haup, at Hue, um, where Ho Chi Minh went and summer. So he gets to go to the prestigious French school for the sons of the great families. He's not part of a village culture. He's right at the center of the elite families uh, coming from uh, central Vietnam. Um, and uh, in the 1920s, he, he, he says, when he writes, that he was inspired by, by Ho Chi Minh's article uh, on uh, colonialism on trial. Ho Chi Minh wrote this pamphlet in French uh, in the 20s. Um, and Jap, therefore, uh, gets involved in student strikes, and he joins some of these uh, organizations before the Communist Party. Uh, the Tung Viet, the new Viet, Viet organization, um, the Tan Nian group, which was the one that Fan Boy Zhao had, that Ho Chi Minh uh, takes over. Jap does not join the Kukyung Dang. He does not, he has an option of joining this, but he's also from central Vietnam rather than the north. Um, and um, by the, by, um, when the communists are organized, he joins, he joins up with, with the communists. So his background too, I suggest, Jap's background is from a French perspective. Now Jap's career, before he becomes a military man, is he's a high school teacher in French about military history and other things. And he studies the career of Napoleon. His, his great sort of influence are French generals and Napoleon. Not, he knows Vietnamese history to some extent. And there is a story, which you can hear, that as, as Ho Chi Minh wanted to work for the French and was rejected, Jap wanted to be, I think when he tested to get into university, is a version of the story I've heard, that on the French system, you, the, your, your papers were scored from like 1 to 15. And I think the cutoff was like 13. You had to score a 13 or higher to get into at the, uh, uh, after Lycée. You take the big exam after the Lycée. You have to score 13, 14, or 15. You get to go up to the next level. If you don't score, you don't get up. And, and Jap scored just underneath the cutoff. So the story is he went to see the... Uh, the French officials 
who were both with the police and they also overlooked all the Vietnamese intellectuals. Um, uh, and he made a special request that, that an exception be made for him, that he be allowed to go on and move up the hierarchy of French education. And he was rejected. So again, you speculate. I mean, if Jap had been, if somebody had said, young man, you know, we see promise in you, we think you and France can really get along and we'll let you in, he would have had his career, again, uh, with, with French patronage, moving up the system. Um, the, um, one of the key, uh, the key, and perhaps one of the most, com uh, most um, important communists, Americans don't know much about him, is, is Lei Zuan. Probably the two most important communists in modern history uh, were Lei Zuan and Lei Duc Tha, neither General Jap nor Ho Chi Minh. The two people whom foreigners think are the great Vietnamese leaders of communism were probably not as important as Lei Zuan and Lei Duc Tha, because Lei Zuan and Lei Duc Tha controlled the party. And it was Lei Zuan who basically um, pushed the effort to conquer South Vietnam in 59. Um, and, and his background, um, he was born in Quang Tri, right here. Notice how these Vietnamese communists, they're all coming from right here. Central Vietnamese, the, the, the base of the Nguyen family control. And um, so he comes from there and in, uh, he worked for the railroad service. He only got high school education. 1931, he was arrested for his political activities and sentenced to 20 years hard labor. Um, Mai Chi Ta, uh, doesn't tell, this is Mai Chi Ta's autobiography. Mai Chi Ta is the half-brother of Lei Duc Ta, and he spent his years with the, with the secret police, with the political police. Uh, he was an enforcer. But what he writes about here is uh, when he's a young man, he comes, he's, he's, from, he's in the south. He also studies uh, in 1936, um, he is in the second class at also um, the Kukhaup, the same school in Hue. He goes to the same elite school. So Mai Chi Ta comes, has an, uh, elite, um, an elite background as well. And he also says that when he's in school, the books which really, he had two kinds of books really inspired him. One were the novels of Victor Hugo. He was particularly inspired by Les Miserables, uh, Le Pêcheur en Mer, the, 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 uh, the Fisherman, and Le Semeur. He also liked the, uh, the Chinese novels about, about famous warriors, uh, written, or Chinese style novels about romantic stories, like you know, our action comments, Batman, Superman, stuff like that. Big, long, big, long stories by Nguyen Phu Duc. Um, and the, the, the stories of the righteous warriors uh, from the old times uh, who, would, uh, who w went into the work of uh, saving the poor and the destitute and getting rid of the, the, the barbarians and the bandits and uh, killing the corrupt uh, uh, officials and their servants uh, and, and help uh, uh, pulling the poor people and helping the poor people who were being oppressed. He said, these really inspired me. Um, so again, we have, we have in the personal uh, backgrounds of these leading communists, uh, something which, which is, is very sort of French. Now, I would submit to you that the dynamic of the communist leadership is a newer generation of these Mandarin families who are replicating the Nguyen dynasty technique in new circumstances. They're combining a, a te, they're combining foreign power, in this case, Russia, and the common turn with a foreign ideology. The Nguyen dynasty used, the, originally they used the Te of the French, uh, and then they also used Chinese Neo-Confucianism. The sons and grandsons of these same Mandarins are using a foreign power, common turn backed by Russia, and Marxist-Leninism as a foreign ideology coming into Vietnam. And Marxist-Leninism talks about class rivalries and class struggles, just the way sort of the Neo-Confucianism talked about the good Mandarin families who get to rule the villages. And it was the French, starting in the 1930s, who observed the similarities between communist Vietnamese and the, Confu and the old line Confucian Vietnamese. 
arguing that the evolution of Vietnam was from Confucianism to Marxism. And so French intellectuals contribute to the misunderstanding of Vietnam, which ended up in the American anti-war movement. The, uh, in 1965, starting in 1965, when the American anti-war movement was forming, and they were writing books about Vietnam. Why is there a war in Vietnam? Why the Americans should not go help the South Vietnamese? Uh, people like George Tatum in particular. And, and if you read all the books, it goes to uh, um, the uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, all the, the, the intellectuals from Harvard who broke with Lyndon Johnson, who went with Bobby Kennedy to turn against the, uh, uh, the war. Um, if you go to the footnotes, why do they say that Ho Chi Minh and the communists were good guys and the non-communists were bad guys? You go to their footnotes and they, they cite French people because they don't know anything about Vietnam, really. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger in particular. Uh, they don't know anything about Vietnam. Before 1965, basically nobody in America knew anything about Vietnam. So they go to these French, A, because uh, Vietnamese don't write in English, right? And nobody's, they don't, there are no books by Vietnamese about themselves. And the French were there, and the French had this experience, and, you can, and they, these people could read French. And French books got translated uh, into English. We'll talk about this in the, uh, next, in the, the next lecture. But the, the French, there are really just four French people who influenced the entire American anti-war movement. We'll talk about this. One guy is Paul Muse. That guy is Jean Saint-Denis. That guy is Philippe de Villiers. The other guy is Jean Lacouture. Just four Frenchmen. Now, most interesting is Paul Muse because uh, he was a French scholar uh, and he studied Marxism and Confucianism. And he wrote these, he's got this famous book about the Marxism, the Confucianism, and they're all the same. Um, and he argues, by the way, these four men argued in 1945 for French support of Ho Chi Minh. Now, Paul Muse also, it, it's written, he wrote in the 1930s. He's, in, he's an intellectual in Vietnam in the 1930s. And, um, he had some comment that it was interesting that when intellectuals from France would come out to Vietnam, the only Vietnamese they could really get along with and talk to and understand were the communists. And it's easy because the communists were the only Vietnamese, and he says the communists were the only Vietnamese who thought in Cartesian terms. The communists thought in the French terms of Descartes and French rationalism. And if you're a, a sophisticated Frenchman and you come out and you get to meet uh, some Kaudai spirit worshiper who talks about seances with the great God, you know, as a French person, you, you, there's no connection here. Uh, first of all, the people from the VNQDD are probably not even going to want to talk to you. Uh, and most of them are in jail or they're in hiding. And by the way, if you meet one of them, their leaders were just executed. So how can you as a good French person meet with them? So a bond is created between French intellectuals and the communist Marxists in Vietnam. And the French are developing a theory that the evolution of Vietnam is from sort of Confucianism over to Marxism. The other thing, which I will talk about later, but I want to suggest it now as we're going through, is that in, in a rather practical sense, Marxism represents a triumph of French colonialism. Not maybe the best triumph, but it's still a triumph because communism and Marxism came from France. It is a transplanting of Western civilization and thought to these Asian people. It is a victory in the mission civilatrice. Now, it's not the best victory because we don't like Marxism, we don't like communism, we would have preferred Catholicism or this or that or, or whatever else, but still, nonetheless, it's, it's you know, all these communist leaders, where'd, where'd they get their education? They have from us. What's the preferred language they like to use? They, they all speak very good French. They all like French food. Uh, they all have fond memories of their times in Paris. Um, there, there is a misunderstanding of the reality of Vietnamese. Now, um, so we get to the mid-1930s. Communists are sort of, uh, they've been repressed. Their leadership is in jail. There is the Socialist Party wins power in France. So there's a united front movement with the Socialists in France. As a result of that, they release a number of communists um, from prison. 
and they give them a little bit of um, uh, rights to organize. And two new movements come up uh, of some consequence in Vietnam. The first, again, from, from people here, but also up here, and a few people from down here, is the Dai Viet, uh, the Dai Viet movement, or the Dai Viet Quoc Yung Dang. Dai Viet is what? Where have we heard this name before? This is the name of Vietnam under the Lee and Trung and Lei dynasties. This is a movement that's come together and says, no, no, we're Dai Viet. This is the recovery of ancient traditional Vietnamese nationalism and sense of purpose. Uh, and it's, it's also the Quoc Yung Dang, so it comes out of the Quoc Yung Dang, and it was founded in 1938. It gets started by a young student, Trung Tu An, um, in Hanoi, and there are several aspects uh, to the Dai Viet. First of all, it's a Dang. It's a party organization. <coughs> Uh, what starts to happen, oh, it's happened with the Quoc Yung Dang before. Uh, I forgot to mention that to join the Quoc Yung Dang, it's, like, it's kind of like, if you will, a marriage ceremony. A marriage ceremony, you know, two people get together, you make a promise, you pledge to, to, to be loyal, to join the family, something like this. To join a Dang, you have to have an oath. You have to take an oath, you have to swear that you will be loyal to the party and all its members and you will live up to its ideals. And starting with the Quoc Yung Dang, you take the oath before an altar to the ancestors of the Vietnamese, and an altar to the Tô Quoc, to the ancestors of the nation. So you are committing yourself, men and women, joining the party to the ancestors of Vietnam, to the traditions, to the people, to all the spirits. Nothing about the Nguyen Dynasty. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing about Chinese Neo-Confucianism or things like that. So, and the Dai Viet, they continued this. You have to take an oath to join the party. Now, uh, I'll get in a, in a second. Um, the original version of the Dai Viet theory, it's a theory called Yung Tap Shinton, was put together by Trung Tu An, and in the context of the 1930s, it had a kind of, um, it was, it was influenced by the notion of ethnic nationalism closer to the Japanese and, and the Nazis in Germany and a sense of a leader. It was, it was saying that what is happening in the world, that heaven is moving forces, that, that nation states are rising up. And the time has come for the Vietnamese to be a nation and have a nationalist movement like the Japanese and like the Germans were doing. And the way, and, and Trung Tu An had uh, more of a theory that there has to be a leader of the, of the force in the spirit. Again, the great leader is a, is a Vietnamese tradition we've seen for centuries. Um, and uh, so you have the, the leader in the party, and they mobilize and organize other Vietnamese to uh, throw out the French. Now, the Dai Viet theory is going to be rewritten uh, in the uh, 1950s in this volume right here by Professor Wee. Um, after in the 1950s. I'll talk a little bit about this now uh, to give a sense of what, what it means to be a Dai Viet. Uh, from the Dai Viet, there also sp spun off a couple of other things. There were several Dai Viet parties. There was also a few years later another group called the Dai Viet Zui Young uh, by a man by the name of Li Doma, and I don't have any of his books. The, uh, he was murdered. In fact, well, I'm now starting to talk about a lot of the people, a lot of these Vietnamese, the Wa Hao, the Khao Dai, the QDD, the Dai Vieks, are all going to be murdered by the communists. Uh, and that's what sets off the civil war in Vietnam after World War II. So we'll talk about that in the next, in the next uh, lecture. But there was another group called Zui Zung, and the Li Dom A uses a lot of yin-yang thinking about fate to figure out what the Vietnamese have to do. Uh, but the Dai Viet are trying to deal with the challenge of how do you think about being Vietnamese in a modern scientific world with dominated by, by Western culture. How do you do it? Because the old Vietnamese thinks you believe in heaven, you believe in spirits, you believe in the rivers and mountains. That doesn't quite work in, in a world of engineers and PhDs and, and quantum, quantum physics and calculus and things like that. So what Trung Tu An tries to do in a non-religious way, the Kaudai are sort of saying we can do this in a religious format. 
he tries to come up, the word science, tries to come up with a scientific, rational basis uh, for being Vietnamese. And what he goes to is sort of some of the social Darwinist theories of individuals and races and groups. And he points out that the Europeans also think in ethnic terms. If Germans can think about being German, uh, then the Vietnamese can think about being Vietnamese. And the issue then becomes, what's the relationship between the individual and, and the group? Because once you get to, it's okay to be Vietnamese, now you're in a position of saying, you don't need the French. We can run our own country. So that is happening in, up here, uh, 1938, 1939. Now, down here, way down in the Western Delta, in 1939, uh, we have the Wahau religion come forth. And this we, we, I mentioned in uh, some of the previous lectures, but the, um, the importance of the Wahau religion is, I think, like the Kaudai, it turns its back on the West and on French civilization and goes into the Vietnamese tradition at the level of peasants and villages and develop something, but it is developing it out of a Buddhist tradition. Cao Dai is sort of a spiritualist uh, Taoist pantheon. And the, the origins that go into uh, uh, the Wahau are first a kind of uh, special kind of melanistic, melan melanarian Buddhism, where the Buddha of the future, at some point the Buddha of the future is going to appear, and, there's, and that's going to be a, sort of like the end of time. And there's going to be a dragon flower assembly. And when the Buddha of the future appears, all the good people will be saved and all the bad people will go to hell. So there's a prediction uh, that, that, uh, that uh, the time is coming, that the Buddha of the future is coming, so we have to get ready. And the way you get ready is you take care of your own inner virtue, your own morality, your, your own dukkha. And, you, and you're, you're in a Buddhist tradition of, of good behavior, the, the Noble Eightfold Path and things like that, to get ready for the coming of the future Buddha. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to go to a pagoda. You don't have to do prayers in a pagoda. You can develop your goodness inside your own house, inside your own self. Uh, and one of the first uh, teachers in this way was the 1830s, 1840s, in the Delta, uh, the, the Reverend Master of the Western Paradise, and then in 1939, this young man, Win Fu Shou, in, uh, in the Wahao village of Anjiang, which is down here, goes up, there are like a couple of mountains down here. This, is, this part of Vietnam is all flat, even more flat than, than, than Minnesota here. And there are a couple of mountains. And he goes up to one of these mountains. There's a seven mountains. He goes up to one of these mountains and has some kind of transcendent experience and comes back down and writes his Samyang, which is his poem, uh, which, is, which has uh, lessons for life and predicts the future. Um, and I read some of it in a prior lecture. And um, he also has the power to cure sick people. So people who are sick, he touches them, he gives them special water, I think, and they get better. So he begins to develop a following as someone who is, the other factor here, which is very, very Vietnamese, like the Cao Dai, he is obviously in communication with a higher power. He has experienced something which we ordinary people have not experienced. We can trust him, we can turn to him, we can rely on him. He is bringing down to us some message uh, of the truth about, and about the best way to live. Now, part of, this is one of the Wahau books that they published in 1970. It says, Han Se Dao This is a, how, how to be, a, how to be how to f uh, the, the acts of the way of a good person. Nyung is the same word that Nguyen Tai Help said, if we don't succeed, at least we'll become Nyung. This is, this is the ideal of a Vietnamese. Notice, the communists never talk about this. Communists never talk about Nyung. They never talk about Dao Duk. And they never talk about all these, these, these core values. Another thing to notice, and we can see it here in the 30s, is that the members of the Communist Party are all sort of middle class intellectuals, uh, French trained people, others. They're, Communism is not a village-based phenomenon. Wahao Khao Dai are peasant-based. VNQDD has links to the villages here. The Dai Viet is roughly similar to uh, the communists in social origins, but the Dai Viet people are from here. They're not part of the Nguyen Dynasty Mandarin families here, and most of the Dai Vieks are not well-educated under the French system. 
Most VNQDD dive yaks are maybe like high school, but they all have ties, family ties, personal ties, that go back to, to Vietnamese traditions. And I want to comment here on the, what Fan Boy Zhao started in, in breaking away from the Wing Dynasty and going to the Japanese is now, by the 1930s, is blossoming into a whole new Vietnamese movements about how to build a modern Vietnam which is consistent with our values, our traditions, but which is not going to be run by the French. Now, going back to the Wahau uh, religion, um, one important part of the Wahau teachings of uh, uh, Win Fu Shou, and it comes from earlier, are the Du Ang, du ang Hyung Nia, which are the four gratitudes of um, a filial and righteous person. And so in the way we become a good person, so when we show up at the Dragon Flower Assembly, we're going to be saved. Okay, we got these four things that we have to be grateful for. And we have to act on our gratitude. We don't just talk it. We're supposed to do things about this. So number one is the ung, the gratitude to the Tao Te Ang Cha Mea, the ancestors and the father and the mother. Tao Te Ang is, is a, I think, a word in Vietnamese which doesn't only mean grandparents and great-grandparents, but Tao Te Ang, it goes way, way back. So the Wahao religion says, number one, in effect, remember all your Vietnamese ancestors. You're Viet you're, Wahao, yeah, we're Buddhists and all that, but we're also Vietnamese. Uh, number two is the gratitude to the Duc Nuc, the gratitude to the nation. But it's the Vietnamese words. It's Duc, which is earth. It's Nuc, which is water. Duc Nuc is a Vietnamese phrase for our nation, our country. But it brings with it the images of mountains and rivers, yin and yang, geomancy, the special destiny of, of the Vietnamese people. This is bringing back, right, in 1939, the conceptual framework of Li Tung Kiet of, uh, you know, the 1200s against, uh, or the 1100s, almost 1200, against the Sung Dynasty. Number three is the Ung of the Tam Bao, uh, the three baskets, that's Buddhism. And then number four is the gratitude for the Dung Bao of Anyang Luai, uh, the gratitude for the people and, and humanity. So you've got, you've got in your, your, your four things you have to be gratified, uh, you have to be uh, grateful for, is you've got yourself, your ancestors, your family, your nation, uh, Buddhist principles of moral principles, and sort of universal compassion. So again, we have here in the Vietnamese sense, we've got something that's very individualistic, which also relates to, to universal principles. Uh, and by, uh, there are various estimates, but by the end of World War II, uh, Win Fu Shou has more than a million, maybe as many as two million followers down here. I mean, his message resonates with, with thousands and thousands of Vietnamese. It was also said, we'll talk about this later, but right now to put it in context, at the end of World War II, the Communist Party has about 25,000 members. So what lessons can we draw from Vietnamese history about one message and one effort, which gets, let's say, over a million followers, and another one, which only has about 25,000. That was estimated by the American OSS, a uh, document written by Milton Sachs. Uh, you get a million people, a million Vietnamese following you, you're probably tapping into something that's very Vietnamese. You get 25,000 people following you. Uh, that's, that's, that's something else that's, uh, that's going on. Now, um, I want to um, go through, these are the two volumes, the revision of the Dai Viet theory uh, that was written by Nguyen Ngap Hui, who was my friend and, and mentor. Uh, he started doing this in the 1950s. This was published in 1964 in South Vietnam, uh, but, but uh, um, it, was sort of, it was not officially recognized. The Dai Viet's were always oppressed. They were, their leaders were being murdered either by the French or by the communists. And, the other Vietnamese, like Odin Ziem, didn't like them. So they had no authority to, to publish this. So this was published surreptitiously uh, in Vietnam. And um, if we just go to the table of contents to give you a sense as to how the Diviacs are trying to place the Vietnamese um, in, a, uh, in a modern 
in a modern situation, I mean, how do you, you know, 1939 during World War II, how do you think about who you are and where you're going in the world? So when Professor Wee gets to it, he does the, um, um, first of all, he's got a chapter on um, religions and, and, and philosophies. And he goes to different, uh, Christianity, Confucianism, Islam. Then he goes to the, the theory of democracy. Uh, where did it come from? Origins in England, origins in France. Um, how do we think about it? Then he goes to the, the, the socialist theories, and he describes the materialism of the Marxist-Leninists and how that works. Um, then he goes to, uh, in materialism, you have the uh, competition and, and sort of uh, uh, struggles, and, and class struggles and class rivalries. Uh, then he talks about how the, the rivalry of these different ideologies, uh, democracy, uh, socialism, fascism, uh, and fascism. Uh, and then he goes to uh, the um, uh, Sun Yat-sen's principle. And so he lays out all these different philosophies uh, in Vietnamese, for Vietnamese to, uh, to, to, to read. Then in volume two, uh, he talks about well, where do we go from here? Uh, what is needed? Uh, in an ideology uh, or a cause, a political cause, which is rational. How uh, bleak. And he talks about the requirements of something which is rational and scientific. And then the next thing is we have to start with the individual person. Kai Kwan Ve Kong Ngoi. Notice how he's building his theory on that most ancient and most basic of Vietnamese building blocks, the individual. He is not starting, as the communists do, with class warfare and class struggle and materialism. He's starting with the individual. And nor is he looking at the way the Neo-Confucians did with a hierarchical order under an emperor with, with sort of families being important and mandarins being more important than uneducated peasants. He's talking about every single person, man or woman. That's where you start from. Uh, well, what do you got to deal with? Well. You got, you got human nature to deal with. Um, and that's not necessarily always so good or so friendly. You have to start with the bantan, the, our inner needs and drives as people. Uh, and selfishness, uh, our, our sensual pleasures and sensuality, and our sociality. We need other people. So on the one hand, we're selfish. On the other hand, we need people. We're social creatures. Uh, and, but we got to start with who we are as a people. Then you have the, uh, the theory of sort of life, shinton, existence, living, uh, thriving. You're, you're, you're born as a creature, and, you, and there's a thrust within you towards your own well-being. That's another reality. And uh, one of the bases of this thrust of all human beings is, again, selfishness, a self-orientation. Um, and that leads to, in a sort of social Darwinist tradition, a sense of struggle. The other thing notice here is from this theory, you start with people and you work up, and this is an open-ended uh, theory. It permits a lot of conflict, but it's not a top-down control theory. And remember, I've said a number of times, I think one of the great drivers of Vietnamese is they don't like top-down things. They don't like to be bossed around. This is one that's starting at the bottom and coming up. And it's also the premise with this kind of selfishness is we can't control other people. Somehow you've got to get them to do things because it makes sense for them. Uh, and then the, uh, oh, and then the way, the way you, you, you uh, confront the, the, the survival is you've got to have strength and you've got to be able to change. You have to be able to adopt. And then the next big issue is a society. How do these different individuals, driven with their individual needs and motivations, work together in, in, in groups? Um, and they do, there are different levels of groups. There, there's the uh, people come together at the level of, of ethnic grouping, classes, political, and, and at religious. And these groups fight and struggle among themselves. So then he ends up with uh, political recommendations as to how you organize uh, the, the political structure of a nation which promotes and protects the Shintone of the people, the Yangtab Shintone. And guess what he ends up with? Constitutional democracy. So here, is, here are Vietnamese thinkers who, for totally Vietnamese reasons, end up as supporters of constitutional democracy, i.e., just what we Americans like and have. 
for very similar reasons. There are great parallels between this way of thinking and John Locke. If you read John Locke, he starts with individualism and private property and selfishness, and how do, you, we, how do we protect each other against other people messing around with, with our individuality? We've got to have a government. By the way, we'll talk about this much later, but that this theory and this man, Professor Wee, this was the basis of the pacification program in South Vietnam, starting in 1968, which defeated the communists. The Constitution of South Vietnam, adopted in 1967, was presented to the Constitutional Assembly by the colleagues and disciples of Professor Wee. And so when democracy is in South Vietnam, it was a lot, there were Vietnamese reasons to do it. And the American anti-war movement never saw that. They never understood the Vietnamese commitment to freedom and democracy. Because uh, this book, by the way, uh, I think, I think uh, for many, many years, this was the only copy of, the, of this book in the West. Right here, these two. Now it's been republished. But it's still in Vietnamese. Um, this one, Professor Wee, um, actually, I, this is, he's autographed this, and this went to Win Sen Thong. Now, Win Sen Thong was the man who translated the poem of Q that, that we read in an earlier lecture. And uh, this copy here, though, uh, this one is, is autographed and presented to me. Um, so I would like to, uh, well, I'd like to end with um, one of Professor Wee's poems. Because again, going back um, in the centuries, Vietnamese who have sort of special reputation abilities are also uh, good poets. And Professor Wee's uh, uh, name uh, as a poet was one of his, one of his, uh, uh, his names was Dang Phuong. He just wrote poetry in the early 50s about uh, when the war was going against the French. And his famous one was uh, An Hum Vo Zan, The Unnamed Heroes. And uh, it's, uh, this, is, this is presented to all the unnamed uh, fighters who have struggled for the Tau Quoc. The, the, the nation, the Tao, all our ancestors, quok, the state where all our ancestors are in. Uh, these, they, they, they are all the, uh, the heroes who have, who have uh, no name. Uh, they live uh, secretly, quietly, in the darkness, in the darkness. Uh, they, nev they never um, receive uh, the, the incense of, of, of honor. Uh, but all their braveries and, and all their braveries and all their sincerity are devoted to helping the nation. Um, and uh, the, uh, towards the end, they're, they're, this, this is a poem, by the way, which I'm told many, many Vietnamese had memorized by heart in the 50s and down to the, uh, even today in, the, in Vietnam. Um, but their blood uh, has, 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 has joined with the, the veins of the earth. Uh, their, their, their bodies have be, have, and their bones uh, have been mixed with the, uh, the, the waters in the mountain, the rivers in the mountains. And their souls together uh, with their, their honor have, uh, wahaup, have all come together to make the one uh, great soul of, of the Vietnamese. Um, and uh, when, uh, when Professor Wee died of cancer, this is a book of a lot of people who wrote things about him. Um, this is what, uh, what I wrote, uh, the, end, the end of what I wrote. Um, as he and I often discussed, um, he, um, he, he knew how do you respond uh, to, to the difficulties of destiny. Uh, what are we supposed to do when the road is dark and heaven has turned its back? Uh, according to Professor Wee, we must continue um, along the road of virtue and duty. Uh, he was uh, an enlightened example for all of us about how to live in this life. Thank you. <laughs>